What's going on, everyone? And welcome to another episode of Talking in Bits, where we walk you through Bitcoin bit by bit so we can provide you with the information you need to succeed and persist. Here we are back again with episode 22. Unlike Bitcoin, we're not capped at 21. We continue to go, but we continue to get wiser as time goes by. And we hope you guys get that value. Got Ben in the house again. What's up, Ben? What's going on, bro? Another beautiful week in Bitcoin, regardless what anybody wants to tell you. What a, what a wild week, man. What a wild week. Uh, super excited about today's guest. So Ben and I have um, Nick Batia, uh, author of Layered Money today. Uh, Layered yeah. Money is one of those, uh, what, what do you think? It's one of those recommended reads when you go start going down the rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you think about Bitcoin and you think about money, uh, it's I think it's wise to understand the history of money uh, and the history of uh, money and layers of money. All right. So Nick does a really good job of breaking down like, you know, this is layer one money. This is layer two. This is layer three. This is the central gold, the, the central bank's position with gold and fiat and, and all these things. And again, the more you kind of understand all of that, the more Bitcoin kind of like makes sense. Um, so I thought it was a fantastic uh, listen, I got it on Audible. Uh, if you're a reader, definitely pick up a copy, um, pick up some extra copies, hand them out to friends, uh, because it really opens your eyes about the financial situation in the world and, you know, its trajectory of where it's going. Yeah, for sure. I um, I never saw money in that type of layered system before. Like, you know, yeah. obviously, you know about these layers after the fact and you're just like, mm -hmm. oh, but yeah, I agree with you. Nick does a very good job of, you know, uh, giving examples like you had historical examples, which is always fantastic. Mm -hmm. But now when you see this layered tier system, um, you could see how, you know, nasty the fiat system is. But you also have hope for what Bitcoin is about to do and that layered system that has yet to come uh, or, or that is being built out in front of our eyes. Uh, so, yeah, excited to talk to Nick. Um, this before I wanted to do this intro because I don't think we could go a whole nother week or I wouldn't like to go a whole nother week, but at least talking about one of the bigger things that happened this week. For uh, sure. And I wanted and I wanted to get your opinion on it. We both, you know, obviously like Michael Saylor and we, yep. we, we love we love the way he speaks. I remember I forgot what episode it was, but let's say one of the early ones, early five ones. or six. Yeah. yeah. I remember bringing up the fact that it kind of I have some fear in an individual being able to buy um, uh, the amount of Bitcoin that you know, Michael Saylor has and that whole trajectory um, mm -hmm. with this whole ESG thing that he just brought up. Uh, and I'm sure the listeners already know about this stuff. Mm -hmm. It kind of, it kind of seemed to be one of these things where it's like, ah, I can see where now this power can be corrupted some way, yeah. some shape or form. Uh, what do you think on that? Yeah. Uh, I oppose ESG anything. Um, it, politically it's, it's almost like the cultural Marxism stuff that's going on right now. Right. Where, it's a political game and, and they're maneuvering things for their own game, uh, but they kind of portray it as if it's in everybody's best interest. Um, so I think on the on the energy end, like the arguments that I'm seeing from people who are mining, like one of the threads I had sent you, this guy's like, listen, I've been mining forever. Uh, and in Canada, like the fuel situation is so bad that like we're not basically creating our own fuel sources we're letting we're basically buying it from america but they're getting it elsewhere and then selling it back to us and how much energy you think is wasted in that process and how like more expensive and inflated is the product now all because we want to move under this guise of you know clean energy or whatever yeah. so i think that same thing is is gonna be happening under esg um i do I feel like I want to, you know, move in good faith with Sailor. Um, you know, everyone's obviously corruptible, right? Um, but I think he's really trying to have a, a discussion and kind of just create data that says this is the trajectory of Bitcoin mining and this is the roadmap to making it clean energy. Um, and I think with Musk kind of on board with that and then other like huge institutional investors, I think it'll kind of just allow more institutional investors to invest. Uh, but at the same time, I, I don't like it, man. You know what I mean? For for reasons that we've discussed, um, because yeah. it could it could get weird pretty quickly, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know? like it. I don't like it at all. Uh, I yeah. do want to go in good faith as well. Um, yeah. And, because... and like, I think what if they would have just uh, set up like a live stream? Like, hey, at one o'clock, we're going to be yeah. talking about these yeah. things. Like, I think if they did that versus saying, oh, we've set up a Bitcoin mining council with yeah. North American miners and we had private meetings. Like I, I posted on Twitter um, a, a picture of the Bohemian Grove. Are you familiar with that? Yep. So, uh, I, you know, I, I posted yeah, I was like, you know, this, this, this is the meeting of, you know, Sailor yeah. Musk and, you know, all these other people. It's like, bro, just live stream that or, or record it and, and post it. Right? Yeah. And, I, and, and I like... let us kind of deduct what we made from it. I just don't think you have the authority to do so. Um, sure. is my opinion. I mean, you you yeah. were you were inducted into a network that you know doesn't belong to anybody. 
and right. you, your behavior shows otherwise. I want to I want to go in good faith and and saying that if he's able to get you know quote unquote the Fed off of miners' backs, mm-hmm. cool. But when you position yourself as this individual that not only has a big stake in it, um, but now has other powerful figures that can also take up big stakes in it, and then mm-hmm. try to speak for individuals like the person you just said that has been mm-hmm. doing it for years. Um, you're playing with fire. Um, I think it's more villainish than it is noble. Um, yep. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on this very closely because it goes back to, like I said, what can an individual with a lot of stake in something be able to do with his influence? And we're watching it. The market is sitting at this 38 level. And that's because of uh, Mr. Clown over there, uh, Elaine. And now we have, you know, one of our figureheads kind of basically going incognito mode. And, and, and kind of meeting with the enemy, if that makes sense. Not that Elon sure. Musk is, is an enemy, you know, he's, yeah, yeah. he's just, but you know what I'm saying? At the moment, he's, he's not. And then you anonymously went in the background when, like you said, you could just film these things. You could just, you yeah. know, and then if I'm not mistaken, I saw a bunch of people that were up on that board. I didn't see slush pool. Yeah. Any of those people. I didn't see compass mining people. I could be wrong. I didn't, I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't, I saw, like you said, the more institutional investor ones and listen, man, Yeah, it, Mara was up there, right? It's just institutional investing mining stuff. Yeah. yeah. And it's like eventually they're going to go to the to the Fed level and say, hey, these are the rules that we think is clean mining. Yeah. Um, Which is what KYC Bitcoin and right. no coin join and, you know, all these other weird things. It, it, it's a yeah. lot of ramifications. There's a lot of shit. So I think he yeah. fucked himself on that. I think he, ex- he exposed his cards in that and that's yeah. in this situation. Uh, I'm not surprised because billionaires do billionaire shit. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, and maybe our guests could shine a little light on this, historically, billionaires do fuck shit that fuck everybody else's shit up. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, so, let's see what Nick says. Yeah, let's see what Nick says. And, and I'm going to watch it closely. I don't know what can change. Maybe, you know, we could be optimistic with Michael Saylor, but um, I'm not optimistic with billionaires. They don't have a track record for one to be optimistic with. Uh, right. So, yeah, man, we'll see what happens. But I think in the future sense, they're going to end up fucking themselves over because this could be a simplification and I could be wrong. But I think at the end of the day, if they mine these green blocks and the nodes say we don't agree to that block, they're just wasting their time. Right. Like I think I still think at the end of the day, they could go as far as getting, you know, a legislation passed and rules for mining and all that stuff. And if the nodes decide this ain't the yeah. block, mm-hmm. consensus will always win and your block will always get rejected. And they will just keep doing it. I guess what they're going to label the dirty way. I mean, if they make it clean, then our way is dirty, I guess I'm right. assuming. Right. So, right, right. Very weird story. I don't want to ramble on that. I just didn't want a week to go by. Uh, sure. without without bringing up michael saylor um damn it damn it I, I, it doesn't look good it doesn't look yeah. good I, I you know i try to be you know i've heard a few people make great arguments for hey guys we've been fighting this fud forever like if he can mm-hmm. put a stop to it with his power and all yeah but see but now you're putting him up on a higher horse now yeah and you keep putting him up on a higher and higher and higher horse and then eventually yeah. he's gonna get corrupted because power will corrupt at some point in time yeah i mean like has a, lot of a, a lot of the arguments are like <laughs> like the whole clean energy thing. And if, if we're talking about Tesla, like there's a lot of dirty energy created to right. create lithium batteries. You know the what I mean? Irony. So like so like who are you to sit here and say like, oh, Bitcoin have it must have clean energy. Like when your whole business is off dirty energy and government credits. Yeah. Which once again, it goes back to fuckery. You're fucking around. This is you, you're not dumb enough to not think that making a solar panel is cleaner than what these miners are doing. You're right. not that dumb. But once again, if you're playing in cahoots with the Fed, yeah. if you got if, if if Michael Saylor and Elon Musk are, you know, 4D chessing, like they say, four or five steps ahead of us or whatever, mm-hmm. then they're already seeing all these agreements that they're about to put together with the Fed to be able to do some stuff and to be able to regulate the mining industry or whatever. And yeah. they're, they're going to get wrecked at the end of the day. But my frustration lies in y'all just making this hill harder for us to fight. Mm-hmm. Like we win in. Yeah. Like we winning, we with the black hole is happening, it's sucking mm-hmm. everything up. And y'all billionaires, y'all fiaters just can't help but doing fiat shit. Yeah, and this is gonna make I mean, it harder the, for the average person. That's the all. whole quote unquote agenda 2030 and reducing carbon footprint and carbon energy and all that. Like it plays into everything. So yeah, I yeah. get I get why they're allowing that to spill in here, but uh yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens with it. Hopefully, yeah, uh, yeah, getting folded like lawn chairs, man. The Fed yeah. is coming down on Michael Saylor like you bum ass. You better, <laughs> you better say right. some shit that we want you to say. Or we're gonna close your whole shit down. <laughs> I hope and that's was, not true. Yeah, yeah that, that's just that's, that's just me. Case. That's me talking shit. But yeah, it kind of seemed it kind of seemed that that's what happened with Elon, right? It was like the regulators came and he was like, uh, "Hold on, I need this money." You, yeah, you got to think. I mean, Elon has a handler. You know what I mean? 
What can, like, can you more? What do you mean handle? No, it? just just like <laughs> someone who like calls the shots. Like, yo, do this, do that. Say oh, this, you don't say think that. he calls the shot? Uh, for the most part, but I mean, who like who came to him and and said push the ESG stuff and then you know say this about Bitcoin and and like we talked about it earlier. It's like okay, he could be playing this to just then push Tesla solar panels with a Tesla solar battery that allow and maybe even a Tesla mining unit. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Imagine if Tesla said, hey, we'll give you a mining unit and your solar panels will pay for it. Like, That's I don't know. It's, it's, it's dope, it's, but it's, yeah. it's stupid. It's stupid because yeah. you could do that. You could do that work with the miners. Yeah, right, right. Like you could bring them on and build this shit without none of this ESG shit. Yeah. I, I think what changed Elon Minds was a big fat check from the federal government. Gotcha. I, I do. At some way. Like, hey, listen, yeah. man, if you if you want your your credits, you know, your yeah, Tesla your renewal credits. for your credits and maybe a little more on the side because we're really trying hard to push this ESG shit. Why don't you become our figurehead and why don't you tackle this? Because we have this own digital dollar coming out and we can't have competition against this dollar because then nobody will adopt it. Right. Right. Like Bitcoin's already adoption proof. Like it's, it's going around the world. But now they want to get this digital dollar in the way. And, you know, you sort of, sort of like these celebrities are selling this COVID shot. You use celebrities to debunk Bitcoin. It's the same thing. Yeah. Like you just pay them. And unfortunately, it sucks because, I, you know, yeah, character is fate. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and it sucks that you, people still bend over for cut bucks. Uh, it's very weird, especially Bitcoiners. It's very weird because you know yeah. what's going on. You know what that is. And I always say 10 times zero is zero. If right. you know this thing is going to zero and you're trying to 10x your bag, you're going backwards. It doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, but we still live in dollars. Yeah, but you, where are we going here? Like, are you going right. to stack some sats or are we going to go chase the fiat? And, you know, I hope to thank our heroes, which I was going to name mm -hmm. this episode, but I probably won't because heroes. Uh, we got Nick. But yeah. I was going to call it something along the lines of like dead the heroes or like burn mm -hmm. the heroes because... You know, we, we don't need these guys uh, and they do billionaire shit. And I think this is another billionaire move. Don't do no damn closed meeting in Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. If they, if they were a clubhouse, they would have got a lot more respect uh, like when, they, when you come on and say there's a, a closed you know, meeting and these yeah. are what we came up with. It's like. Right, right, right. Uh, with, no, with no outside opinion. And like I said, not even like the real hands on mining, mining companies. Uh, yeah. or or miners like popular ones were even involved man right uh i've been i know you follow him too but i've been i've been you know marty bent has the most spectacular takes on this mm -hmm. um because this is revolution and i think people forget it i think people forget yeah. it i think people really think that it's about bags it's about cashing out and maybe it is to some people that's fine but i like listening to guys like marty because they understand that once again 10 times zero zero this is a revolution and they're just mm -hmm. making it that much harder for the average club the average person to be able to take their wealth and be able to take it into their hands Average miners are miners. I, 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 uh, I tweeted it earlier, which is like, I'm at a loss right now, but it's perfectly cool because I know mm -hmm. what it is that I'm getting in return and I'm okay with that. But right. now these dudes are going to change the game. And now yeah. I won't be able to do this at home and take sovereignty yeah. because I'm going to need to pass some legislation or get an ID. Here in Massachusetts, dude, mm -hmm. think about it. Oh, if you want to mine or you got to pay a, a Bitcoin sticker. miner ID. Come on, man. I'm all set Come with on, that, man. man. Sailor, we're going set. uphill. We're going uphill. This fight is already hard enough. This fight is already long enough. This is like when the colonial army was starving and the British army was full mm. and they were mm -hmm. trooped up and they had their, their weapons and the colonial mm -hmm. army had nothing. We were like in socks and we were just mm -hmm. eating barefoot. like yeah, Bloody eating and animals, in yeah, the animals that were dying. Yeah, and we were doing this fight and that's what we're doing right now. That's where we're at. But the tide is turning. Mm. And then we get billionaires doing billionaire shit because they can't mm. help but be greedy. Even I'm telling you, I, I have good faith in Sailor, but let's not get into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Our, uh, the guest is Nick. Um, guys, we're going to introduce him. He's going to introduce himself and all that. But check out, like Ben said, Layered Money. Um, I think the first time um, I, I, I did the audio book and I did it at a higher speed. This time I was able to read it in a, a regular speed and I got more out of it the second time. And yeah. I couldn't figure out if that was just a speed change or just the second run through. Um mm. But I uh, I enjoy the book, guys. Pick it up on Audible on Amazon. I'm sure uh, Nick will leave his links. Uh, awesome, good work. Uh, I heard him on McCormick's podcast. I think he's already working on his next book. Nice. Uh, so so super cool stuff. Um, and as always, guys, share this, uh, rate it, subscribe. It all helps the algorithms. It helps us know what it is that you guys want. Tag some big corners that you think should be you know featured in these shows so they can give you some of their wisdom and give it to us too. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I won't speak for Ben, but I'm just a fan here. I, I'm just mm -hmm. getting to do this pretty cool. So Same rate, here, share, subscribe. Let's get this going. Uh, we're gonna get right into Nick. All right, and we're back, guys. We got Nick Batia in the house. Uh, Nick is the author of Layered Money, which Ben and I just talked about, which is um, an incredible read. It, it, and that's saying, you know, the very least. It, it's an awesome read. You guys should pick it up. Nick, thank you for your time. I'm sure everybody's chasing you right now for interviews and, and you're moving around fast. Uh, thanks for being here, man. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. 
Yeah. So uh, before we get into a deeper conversation, because you blew my mind, I didn't know. I didn't. I never thought of money as a layered approach thing. I was very. I think most people are very ignorant to that whole pyramid, you know, system that's going on in your book did a fantastic job of not only traversing through history and being able to explain to us, you know, why, you know, how, how the downfalls and why it even came about, but then also going into more of the future and Bitcoin and stuff like that. So Nick, please let the listeners know um, a little bit, a little bit more about yourself and what you got going on right now. Yeah. So uh, I wrote a book last year called layered money. I published it in January and the book was, written to be an introduction to Bitcoin, but in order to introduce Bitcoin, you have to give some sort of context for money. So I, I knew I needed to tell a history of money, uh, but I wanted to do it in a different way because I've read a few books that are a history of money and I didn't want to repeat you know, things that I've read. Uh, and then when I stumbled upon a paper called The Inherent Hierarchy of Money, uh, and I saw this relationship of financial institutions with each other falling into a hierarchy in which uh, institutions are ranked and the instruments that they issue are ranked amongst each other, not just the fact that we have different forms of money, but they have an order to them. Uh, that really got my creative juices going when it comes to Bitcoin and how to explain it for, for everybody. People that don't have a background in finance or in Bitcoin necessarily uh, just want a an approach to how do I think about money and how do I think about Bitcoin as a as a new type of money and so that was my goal with layered money is to write uh, an, uh, a book that anybody could pick up it gives you a little history of money and then a preview as to why Bitcoin is here and here to stay that's fantastic um I, I I'm a history buff well I like to think I'm a history buff so I was very enthused with the whole history aspect and um, like you said in the cahoots, I had a question that when I was at work listening to the book, I actually was like, I have to ask Nick this question. Uh, so you explain how the Daenerys um, around the time of Marcus Aurelius was basically at 3.4 grams. Um, now, Marcus, as somebody who, you know, reads Stoicism and follows that, you know, the philosopher king, you know, I think about the Antonog plague where he basically gave, sold all the trinkets and the gold of, uh, of the empire to be able to help the people. So my question is, and I know this is going completely into it really fast is it, it, are these systems just bigger than one person because i would like to think that marcus aurelius doesn't fit you know the tyranny type um or, or or is it he was just a part of that whole tyranny as well no um slight devaluation to a currency by one ruler um you know doesn't necessarily mean that you're you're talking about a tyrant okay um, you know, if you have to pay the bills as a leader, um, you know, you're going to steal from the future a little bit by shaving, shaving the metal or devaluing, I'm talking about in that era. Mm -hmm. We see something similar today where, let's say we have the COVID panic. The U.S. Treasury and the Congress of the United States, they're not going to sit there with their, sit on their hands. They're going to borrow from the future in order to sustain the economy and uh, the people with direct payments. And you know, from their political standpoint, that's what they know and that's what they do. And so there's, there's thousands of years of that um, in history that we can draw from. So I don't even think that, yes, it is definitely bigger than one person, it always is. And um, you know, especially with currency devaluation, it's oftentimes that the government just doesn't have any other way to pay um, because you can't, it's either that or you go and seize property, you know, on the spot. And so you either seize property on the spot or you borrow from the future and tax and hope the tax covers it and hope your government sustains long enough for you to pay it back. So, um, yeah. you know, that's what, that's what would be my thoughts on, you know, ancient Greece. Yeah. Yeah. So would you say it's a feature of the monetary system or uh, not a bug? The being well, able to steal from the future <laughs> it, uh, it it is for governments um that okay. is that, yeah that, that is definitely the case it, it's definitely a feature of governments that and that's part of the reason why we're not on a gold standard or we don't use gold at uh, gold coinage as our money today because uh it doesn't gold coins as the only money doesn't give us any flexibility it definitely doesn't allow us to borrow from, borrow from the future to pay for things 
how can you borrow physical gold from the future? It doesn't, you know, so you have to have credit instruments and, um, and that's why we have a credit money system. So I think that is natural and a credit money system, I think is, it's not a bad thing. It's just how we operate as human beings. And we, we like to borrow from the future to build today. And we're okay with giving a, giving a little bit of the profits back to the person that gave us that, you know, and that's called interest. And so mm-hmm. that is also something that is as old as time. And, and we have examples of interest and lending, um, you know, that go back thousands of years, way before gold coinage. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, bef- can you give the listeners a little bit of your background? You see, you're obviously well-versed in money. Uh, you, you have a firm grip understanding. Do you, you do this for a career? What's your background? Yeah. So I started my career in the investment management industry. I have a master's in finance and I have a CFA charter holder. I'm a CFA charter holder, um, which is a, an investment analyst. Uh, designation. And so I worked in the fixed income industry for four years, in, uh, sorry, six years, including a four years trading US treasuries and other interest rate products for a very large investment manager, um, trading sometimes, uh, you know, over a billion dollars a day in notional value. Um, and the investment manager that I was at had uh, over a hundred billion dollars in assets under management. So big clients, um, public and private clients, uh, and and so I really got to not only you know trade the markets at a high level, but also interface with researchers on Wall Street and some of the top minds out there. And so I've always been fascinated by global macroeconomics, and um, I just read as much as I could while I was in the industry. And uh, you know, eventually Bitcoin did pull me away, but my background and my you know uh, my career goals as a, a young person was in the investment management industry. And so I've always, I've always been on that track. Nick, do you still trade? I do not. I do gotcha. not trade. I don't trade for, uh, for a shop, uh, nor do I trade uh, personally speaking. Gotcha. You know, I, I have a portfolio as, as anybody does, uh, but I'm not a trader. And I employ my... Um, my experience and my expertise as a trader in a lot of the things I do, but it's just not trading anymore. Trading is a behavioral study. And um, sometimes the best trade is to buy and hold. Um, So I'm employing that tactic with Bitcoin, uh, for example. So that is the trade. I'm trading by, by, I'm trading by not trading there. Um, uh, There's an old traders adage, the trend persists. And so it's my, one of my favorite sayings. And so if the trend persists and we can identify a trend, then get into it. Uh, there's another saying I like, um, Jesse Livermore, uh, one of the most famous stock traders of all time uh, from a hundred years ago said, I made my, my most money, my, big, my biggest uh, gains, by, not by trading, but by being right and sitting tight. Mm. And so... Um, all of these things you ask, you know, do you trade? No, but I still study it so much. I still, st- I got the chart right here, the Bitcoin chart right here on my screen. And it's up because price action to me is uh, the truth. And it is my, it's my foundation. It's why I'm in Bitcoin because I, and I identified a trend that I felt could last for a long time, long enough to even shift my career into it. And, uh, and so um, you know, that's what I did. And that is, it's, it's part of my approach to everything is um, the behavioral study and buyers and sellers and, and the trader mentality. Awesome. When you got into Bitcoin, did you start by trading or did you just start with buying and holding? Yeah, no, um, yeah. it was never a trade for me. It was awesome. a, it, it was a position. It was an allocation. It was a form of property and, uh, and uh, definitely like um, a, a gift to my future self. Like this is something that you're going to set away for yourself. Mm-hmm. And uh, I still, I still carry the same uh, mentality um, when I, you know, when I think about Bitcoin and when I'm, or when I'm looking at my portfolio. There you go. Last year I traded uh, options a bit, lost not a ton of money, but I lost money. And obviously you take on stress and right. That, that costs too. Right. Um, but I've made so much more just buying and holding Bitcoin, just dollar cost averaging. So yeah, there's, right. uh, there's no and stress I, there. 
And I always try to tell people that, you know, trading is so much more difficult than you might think. I got my first gray hairs at like 24, <laughs> 25 years old. Um, yeah. Because, because of large positions that are open overnight and, and things sure. of that nature. And yeah. this wasn't, this wasn't in Bitcoin. This was before, right. um, this is way before, you know, I did, did even knew the word Bitcoin. So, um, it's, it's, it's very tough. It's extremely emotional. Um, oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. before, <laughs> before you trade, read the book, thinking fast and slow or, or read something on behavioral finance to understand that you're not going to be basically you're not going to be successful at it um unless you understand be and you know unless you understand behavioral finance and so it's extremely yeah. difficult and uh definitely not something i recommend to anybody yeah and so much I so I, you know I, I i wanted to get away from trading because it's a very stressful um mm -hmm. it's a very stressful life yeah yeah that's why i don't thousand play in percent it. agree I, yeah i i can't I, I can't handle the emotions of it i can't ha and i can't be in front of a screen all day i, I just don't have that type of life and the yeah. few times that i've tried wrecked is not even the word like no. i yeah. i haven't even gained a single dollar or two and uh, i know what i'm not good at and it's not trading for sure yeah, yeah. so so on the concept of behavioral why i find it that it's extremely difficult for the average person to buy and hold why is that in your opinion of course yeah um it's because they it's the, the the funny thing is that behavioral finance and the study of the behavior is this idea that uh you buy when others are uh fearful and sell when others are greedy the old warren buffett saying mm -hmm. um or that um you know the crowd is the crowd is wrong um that those types of concepts are a study because people don't understand that. Like, and so it's a, it's a, it's a funny way to answer it, but it's basically people can't buy and hold because they haven't studied that buying and holding requires removing bias and removing behavioral tendencies from the process and taking a purely analytic approach. People aren't able to remove biases and be their behavioral tendencies they're they're just not able to and the best traders are and that's why some of the top performers now are 100 percent algorithmic uh they're taking all emotion out of trading um it's why algorithms dominate all markets now and uh in the short term uh it's robot driven in the long term i'd still like to think that things are valuation driven amazon hasn't gone up thousands and thousands of percent because of algorithms. Okay. Um, it's gone up like that because they take, you know, they're taking over the world and their trucks are here, you know, 18 times a day on my street <laughs> and um, at my door three or three times a day sometimes. And so, um, you know, it, but people cannot buy and hold to go back to your question. They can't do it because um, when things go down, they panic and they sell and the news tells them that the world is ending and when it goes up a lot they can't not sell because there are two reasons there they can't not sell because they um you know they want to cash in the gains because they you know made a profit or also because reallocation and rotation is a natural you know, a uh, natural tendency also. It's it's natural to like kind of try to take some chips off the table. And um, so people do that. So when Jesse Livermore said, be right and sit tight, he was talking about that if the trend's not over, you're doing yourself a disservice by getting out. Um, and, you know, identifying the end of a trend is, is, is also very difficult. That's why, you know, that's why we have an industry and everyone's competing all the time uh, for returns and investment managers are getting fired and, you know, hired every day, um, because somebody else is outperforming you. Yeah. It's a, it's a crazy game. I think Warren Buffett had said, uh, I think when questioned on like, why don't more people invest like him? And I think he had said something like, because no one wants to get rich slowly. I think what entices people, you know, especially Instagram pages, stories, you'll see people who are trading and they're like, you know, I made a thousand dollars in 10 minutes and like, yeah, we, everybody wants that. Um, and, and that becomes really enticing. Um, yeah. And also the... like, 
you know, short-term gains are not compounding. And so, um, you know, true returns are earned when they're compounded and yeah. tra trading, uh, it, it's, it exists in antithesis to the idea of compounding that the, they're almost opposites. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that would be an interesting kind of, uh, thought experiment to break down the two words and really like, uh, but the, I, I think that they're, you know, in antithesis to each other. Yeah. And I conviction, agree. I think has a big piece to do with it too. Uh, sometimes when I felt in the past that I needed to make a move and, and not hold or anything like that, I just go back to the work. I mean, there's so much good work out there, including your work, including so many other contributors, uh, contributors to, to Bitcoin that I just go and get and refocus my conviction and then just come back and understand this ain't going anywhere. <laughs> right. We're going to keep holding this. That's definitely important to do. Yeah. And th actually I realized that, um, you know, I've realized that a lot in the last few weeks, even with the price and, you know, because people text you and you're just like, how did you lose your conviction? Right. Mm. Um, Same here. Or, or, did you even, did you even read my book? Like, did you? Read it? <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, but it, you're right. It it is tough to stay convicted, and um, conviction comes through you know study. So that's why maybe people that can't buy and hold because they haven't studied enough of it to be convicted enough. I agree with that. Yeah. So I've always been curious. So when did you get introduced to, or when did you go into Bitcoin, Nick? So, uh, in 2016, mm -hmm. I had, um, I've been a big fan of the website zero hedge, um, because while now it's more of a, a platform for posters, um, you know, back in the day, they, it was, there were no ads, uh, you know, guest posts. It was all just a couple guys just, you know, doing deep studies of the markets. And so I was a huge fan of Zero Hedge back in the day. And they always had Bitcoin stories, but I, I never read them, you know, I just scrolled through. And uh, I did that for a few years, um, like 2013 to 2016. I just scrolled through the Bitcoin article, never read it. And, uh, you know, I'd see price go up and down and I'm just like, oh, it's a bit, it's like a video game currency that's become popular. Um, that was my, um, bias going in and, uh, you know, it's just some virtual currency, which I guess it still is a virtual currency, but to me, the, the idea of a virtual currency didn't have any backing or, you know, I didn't understand it at all. So I never did that dive and that was okay. And 2016 came around and, um, I just started to read more and more research from that was being put out by the big investment banks and Wells Fargo put out a report that was, um, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain associated companies that are, um, you know, 10 companies to watch from around the world. And it's like a 40 page, 80 page PDF. And, you know, I'm on all the emails. So I get, you know, all these research things every day in my inbox. And this one caught my eye and I'm just like, wait, you know, now Wells Fargo is talking about Bitcoin and blockchain, like what's going on here? And I read that report and, you know, I'm always looking for, you know, the trend, what's the trend, what's the trend. And I just like, maybe I was late in 2016 to identify the trend, but I was like, this is the trend. And I just started, I just started my research. I bought Mastering Bitcoin. I bought Nathaniel Popper's Digital Gold. Um, you know, I read those two books right away. I started getting into podcasts and listening to Adam Back and Trace Mayer, who's since left the scene. Um, and, um, you know, read Satoshi's white paper. Um, and there was this big debate around SegWit at the time, uh, you know, which is the software upgrade to Bitcoin that allowed for the Lightning Network to take place. So I was like, what is SegWit? You know, what does the software mean? What is Lightning Network? And it was just uh, an immense deep dive study in 2016, completely consumed me um, on the way to work, on the way home, um, you know, sneaking articles at work, like just reading things and, you know, and, and it's still macro for me. So I'm, I'm a macro analyst. So it's not like I'm not doing work. I'm sitting there and I'm reading all the research that I can, but like, 
it was just Bitcoin. I was like, I got to understand this Bitcoin thing. And, um, and the rest is history, really. I mean, it, you know, by the end of 2016, um, uh, you know, finally was able to make an allocation because I understood what I wanted to do with it, how I wanted to buy, how I wanted to withdraw, you know, and then I used Bitcoin, you know, late 2016 for the first time, um, sent a transaction to myself from the exchange. And I was just like, wow, this, this thing is incredible. Um, I never got way deep into uh, like trying to get involved with, um, you know, maintaining a node and, and all these kind of things. I downloaded a node and I kept a node and, and things like that. But, you know, it, a lot of that stuff in the beginning wasn't as important as me trying to understand like how it worked. Yeah. Then you spun up a node, then, you know, I had a lightning node and, and, um, you know, I still have, um, different ways to access the Bitcoin network. And, you know, I'm always trying to teach myself, um, like different node softwares and things like that, um, that are really interesting, but I think like using it finally after all that study and just, uh, it just had me forever. I was yeah. like, this is what money should be. This is, this is definitely, and from my perspective, I'm like, uh, you know, seeing the archaic financial infrastructure, you know, up close and personal, using it every day and seeing that you still have to send, you know, PDF scans in an email to get a hundred million dollars settled. It's like, um, it's very archaic and it still works like that. Um, yeah. In a lot of pockets of the industry. Um, like I can't, yesterday I couldn't get 600 bucks off PayPal. It like, it's just, it's, 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 and, and, and when you realize that Bitcoin doesn't have any downtime, it, 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 it's really in stark contrast to PayPal. Cause like PayPal works well, 98% of the time, let's say, you know, it, it's, 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 it's definitely easy to spend money on PayPal. Like getting it out is a little bit tougher, but um, you know, the fact that there's, there is that downtime or that there, you do get those error messages it doesn't exist in Bitcoin. And that contrast also is so powerful. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let, let's talk about the layers, if you don't mind. Um, if you could quickly run down through the regular monetary layers and then just transition over to Bitcoin. I know we're in layer two right now with Lightning, uh, but can you explain the current monetary layers and then go into the Bitcoin layers? Right. So the most common money, form of money that Americans have, for example, are checking account deposits, right? So you have your Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase accounts, and you got your you got your dollars in on a screen, right? And when you on the screen it says checking, right? Mm -hmm. Those are deposits that are liabilities of that bank. So let's say Wells. So your in in my in my layered framework, your checking account dollars are third uh, third layer money. Okay. Okay. Because on the second layer, the bank that issued you those deposits as a liability to, that, to them, they have assets in the form of reserves at the Fed, for example. Those are their deposits that they keep at the Fed. Those are the Fed's liabilities, right? But they're the bank's assets, they're Wells Fargo's assets. So Federal Reserve issued deposits, which are called reserves, which are only used for the banking system, are on the second layer of money. And then what does the Fed own on their asset side? They own US treasuries. So US treasuries are the first layer of money. That's how our dollar system in the most simplistic way I can operates in a three tiered uh, kind of system where we have treasuries at the top because that's what the Fed owns. The Fed issues reserves to the banking system. They also issue cash. So if you have Benjamins in your pocket, those are second, that's a second layer money in my framework. And then your checking account deposits are a third layer. And this is to show that there's counterparty risk and order to things. Your checking account deposits are not the same thing as cash. They're actually junior to them. They're not, it's, it's not just like one form and the other form. It's actually yeah. senior and junior. And a treasury, you know, a US treasury, um, is the 
risk-free asset of the entire system. So actually banks can own treasuries and kind of create their own money out of it through the repo market or other things like that. So the layered money system that we have today is this idea that the Fed and commercial banks have a senior and junior relationship to each other. And that the instruments that you and I use are mostly issued by private banks, commercial banks like Wells Fargo, not by the Fed itself. And if we do have Fed issued money, it's cash, paper, that's incredibly cumbersome that nobody uses anymore for anything more than you know a hundred dollar transaction. Right. So like an obsolete money is the other type of money that they issue, which is why they're gonna do Fed coin um, down the road, for example. Yeah. But Bitcoin is so different than that because Bitcoin is a commodity. It's not a credit instrument. It doesn't come from any balance sheet. It's not a deposit. Um, your Bitcoin that you own on an exchange is a deposit issued by that exchange. Like if you have a Kraken account and you have a, you know, you log in and you have, you know, a Bitcoin in your Kraken account, that's a, in my framework, again, a second layer money because it's, issued by an institution that holds Bitcoin as the first layer. They own it. They claim to own it. So they have a first layer and then they issue deposit to you. And it's your right to exchange that second layer of Bitcoin, the deposit for the Bitcoin itself, withdraw it to your own wallet. And if the exchange does that, they can earn a reputation as a credit worthy institution. Mm. And so you keep using them. And that's also an example of why layered money is emergent. It's not something that was assigned to us by politicians or central bankers. We said, okay, because we did it with Bitcoin. We said, okay, we'll hold a deposit for a week or a year or you know four minutes um, because we trust you enough. Yeah. And that makes the whole system move. Just Bitcoin by itself as an asset is not enough to build a financial system. Right. It's enough to build a really cool peer to peer digital cash as Satoshi had intended, but a peer to peer digital cash can't be the foundation for the entire monetary system because it has to have layers to it because only with trust, some trust in the system can we do things quicker. Um, Lightning Network does alter that a little bit um, where you're actually uh, taking away a lot of the counterparty risk, but, but speeding it up at the same time in this very you know, new smart contract way that doesn't exist in the traditional realm where all we have is balance sheets. Um, we don't have cryptography and all these uh, you know, fancy tools that Bitcoin has brought us. Um, so you know, that's a little uh, overview of why I wrote a book called Layered Money and why I think layers are so important to understand why Bitcoin is powerful. Yeah, indeed. Uh, the, the layers you were explaining of the monetary system just makes me, uh, you know, remind me of how little control we have uh, of anything that we're, there's a lot of trust being exchanged there, especially if you're interacting in the third layer and um, you, you, you know, you, you, everything that happens underneath, you have no idea what's happening. Most people don't. Um, now, with the example you gave, because I never thought of, of an exchange as a level two, a layer two to Bitcoin, but that's an awesome point. Now, do you think the same um, trust problems will, will run rampant in Bitcoin that run the monetary system, where if you hand too much trust over, it's basically backfiring? Does that make 100%, sense? A hundred percent. And exchanges have failed throughout Bitcoin's history. So that right. we always we already have the historical example of that. Um, I'm sure you're going to have you know, um, some of these companies that are issuing um, Bitcoin yield will fail because of something. Right. And that'll teach it, you know, other lessons. And then you might have insurance apparatuses that, um, you know, help protect, like we have FDIC insurance to protect banks. Yep. Um, I'm not saying that happens tomorrow, but, you know, sure. it, it takes time for trust to build and then insurance mechanisms to develop like at the CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the largest derivatives platform in the world, all the participants have to pay into a rainy day fund to even get going. 
like uh, you know, you know, all these huge banks, they have they have a a huge chunk of money that sits at the CME in, th- in case things blow up, um, and and it's supposed to be cleared. So and it's supposed to be daily margined every day, but there's a lot of concentrated risk at the CME. And so, you know, like that, Bitcoin doesn't have any of those protection mechanisms yet. It's very young, uh, yeah. relatively speaking. And so, yeah, things will go wrong. Companies will go bust. Um, there'll be a run on, you know, exchanges or run on depository institutions where, um, you know, that's, they'll halt withdrawals and it's just like a bank, you know, a bank holiday is, you know, you can't withdraw. That's what a bank holiday is. So yeah, def- we'll definitely see Bitcoin institutions do that. And, you know, I hope that uh, companies that grow in size and in trustworthiness are being audited in a more material way than in the past, because in Bitcoin, we can do proof of reserves and other things that we can see, like what you have on the blockchain and um, like there's there's ways that we can keep the audit more honest. Yeah. So I hope that we do better than the past. Yeah. But thinking that we're not going to have failures and fraud and greedy people and and mistakes, you know, um, we'll definitely have all those things. Yeah. Kind of seems like they go hand in hand, right? You have yeah. To and it's not a reason to not, right. It's not a reason to not buy Bitcoin or not to get involved. It's just it's a reason to do your own research, to be careful, to learn how to use that technology so you don't have to trust. That's a big part of Bitcoin. You don't have to trust. And um, in the dollar system, you do have to trust everything. Yeah. Um, you know. And a, a lot of the debate about Bitcoin itself is silly because it's like, well, I trust the dollar system, so why would I need Bitcoin? And they're like, you know, you trust it, but I don't. So why, why are you taking away my choice? It's my choice to not trust it. It's my choice to reallocate or re-denominate as I like to say. And so, um, you know, it's, it's okay. If you trust it, you can, you can continue to trust it. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Nick. So let's transition into, you know, um, regulation or the possibility of regulation when it comes to Bitcoin and what we can see in the future. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing so far in the U.S. And, and in general, I don't think it matters what any one country does for regulation. What's important is that positive Bitcoin-friendly regulation is happening in um, countries around the world. And so we see that Singapore, Switzerland, United States, um, we see, and you know, Canada, the first really big ETF there now, we, we see positive developments coming. And so um, it's not that the US is oppressive toward Bitcoin, but maybe not as good as Singapore or Switzerland, um, not as you know, forward on the ETF approval as Canada, but still on the right track. No bans, no criminalization of usage, no criminalization of ownership, um, no excess capital gains tax levied, which is one thing that I see politically, you know, a potential for, okay. um, you know, excess, excess capital gains tax, maybe not in the U S but in other countries, perhaps um, something that could happen. And then, you know, forced disclosure of holdings and those types of things that, um, you know, we might see in the U S and other places, but there um, there's always a way to arbitrage regulation and jurisdictions. There's always a way around things. And because Bitcoin is so digital in nature, I think, you know, businesses and people will end up gravitating toward where they can use Bitcoin freely. And um, if people, you know, if countries want to protect their tax base, um, they will be friendly toward Bitcoin because then people will leave. And so, uh, because Bitcoin is global, it doesn't have any borders. Uh, you know, it's just like the internet. Nobody ended up banning the internet because you just couldn't, um, cause you'll lose. So I see Bit- Bitcoin following a similar path, but that doesn't mean, you know, countries will try things, especially, you know, countries with dictators, they'll, you know, try bans, criminalization. Uh, we see Turkey make an announcement recently on that front. 
Um, so, but regulation is not stopping Bitcoin. We have Coinbase now that's gone public. Um, you know, it, it that ship has sailed right. in terms of trying to stop this thing. Uh, I'm hoping to be part of the conversation in DC um, when we think about, you know, not only the fact that U.S. needs a central bank digital currency for policy reasons, um, but that it doesn't compete with Bitcoin. Bitcoin doesn't compete with the dollar necessarily or explicitly. It's good for the government to embrace Bitcoin ownership because then you'll have smart and wealthy people here in the United States building companies and hiring people. And that's what politicians want because um, it's good for business for them. So I think Bitcoin will, um, and we have the environmental narrative that we have to fight, which I know you, you, know, you want to talk about, but um, that will be its own battle and its own narrative that we'll have to you know, uh, jump over. But in general, I, I see very positive developments in Bitcoin regulation, especially now with Bank of New York Mellon and, and, and you know, with custodian products, Fidelity with their digital asset custodian product, uh, these things are, are here and they're live in hugely important companies. So, uh, you know, the United States government fully recognizes this and, uh, you know, banned Bitcoin fear mongering um, doesn't really hold the test of time anymore. Yeah. And it arguably makes the network stronger, right? Because uh, I like the the quote, cypherpunk's code, right? So it, they'll find new ways to get, like you said, around certain things and with taproot activation and, and these things coming in the near future. I just think it makes Bitcoin better, even if they do try to regulate it. So, I mean, I'm not on, you know, a level of understanding that you are in the monetary system, but I would say is that they either have to play along or lose anyways. I, I don't really think they have a choice here. And... If you do the game theory, you yeah. come to that conclusion. Okay. Yep. And 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 so I would I would strongly agree with that. And all you have to do is see that nobody agrees to to know that Bitcoin will survive. Like yep. when, when when people are arguing, that means that the coders are still coding, and um, you know the companies are still building. Builders build, coders code, and uh, that momentum is is unstoppable. So countries realize that. Yeah, I think states are starting to realize, right? The mass exodus that we're seeing to certain states because of their, you know, Bitcoin friendly uh, laws that they're passing. Uh, Texas being obviously one of them. I think we get a new one every every week, it seems like. But yeah. Wyoming, we got a bunch. Yeah. So not only in other countries, we're seeing it here at home, which is right. it's pretty cool. Right. And I'm going to Texas like three times this year for that reason. So, you know, I already. I, yeah, so, yeah. Likewise. Know, yeah. You, you <laughs> well, know, not three times, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I gotta go see people. I gotta go have conversations. I gotta go meet people too. And uh, if they're in Texas, you know, you gotta go and and you gotta make the moves. That's where the industry is. Yep. You, you you know you have to be there, and that's a good thing. That is jurisdictional arbitrage. That drives the change. And all you have to all you need is a couple states to embrace it to to make sure that you know the other forty eight don't um, ban it. And you know no state is going to ban it in the face of full embrace in Texas, Wyoming, and Florida. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I agree in so many ways there. It's not even funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we move on to the ESG stuff, I did have one more question that's sort of related to, you know, inflation in essence. I, I heard you on, on Peter McCormick's podcast say that you didn't use the word inflation in the book, not once. Um, that piqued my interest. Was that on purpose? And what's the reason behind that? Yeah, definitely. It was on purpose uh, at the outset, too. It wasn't even like I toyed with it. I said, I'm going to write this whole book, no mention of the word, nice. because it's not well understood because it has many definitions. And so it's not like people that say, oh, there's inflation. They're complaining about prices going up in their life. Who am I to argue with that? Right. Um, but there are metrics that show the opposite, like in like consumer price indices in Europe have, haven't gone above 1% in a decade. Um, that is largely deflationary from that perspective. Um, from a monetary inflation standpoint, we have trillions of monetary inflation um, since 2008, and that's very uh, zeros and ones. It's like right in front of you. It's not something to debate. Right. And so there's all these debates. So, you know, I either 
spend 20 minutes, I mean, 20 pages breaking down all the different ways to explain the word inflation <laughs> or just not, or just not use it. And so I use, you know, the idea of Marcus Aurelius to the third uh, century um, collapse, almost collapse of the Roman empire mm -hmm. and how, you know, coins can get devalued from Greece to Rome and, and things like that. But kept keeping the word inflation out of the book allowed me to not get the inflation deflation debate going for my readers. And I, I, and I accomplished that because it's been sure four did. months and not one person has contacted me. I've had hundreds of people say, love the book. Here are my questions. Thanks for writing this. I wish you had written a little bit more about this. Not one single person had said, oh, I disagree with you about the inflation or the deflation and, and then start bickering with each other. So, you know, I, I won, I won the battle there <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, awesome. um, and I, I definitely accomplished uh, a Bitcoin narrative without using this, you know, fireworks type of word. Um, it's just, it's, there's too much debate. And I, I just don't like, to, I just don't like having the debate, especially because I fall on this like very narrow demographic cause deflationary narrative that underpins a lot of, you know, my study. Yeah. It's like so nuanced that people are like, oh, you don't see inflation. Yeah. I, my prices are going up too, dude. Like my yeah. house is up 20% in, in three years, you know, and I, it's not because I got great, you know, picked a great neighborhood. It's just, that's what's happening. And so, um, you know, inflation is, is one of my least favorite words and I try to avoid it because that I love that. Yeah. That's why I piqued my interest because it's such a heavy word that gets thrown around so often nowadays. And uh, as soon as I heard you say it, I was like, oh, that is true. I did not yeah. hear that one bit. And if you think about um, like a lot of the ex explanations for Bitcoin and the narratives, the word is used a lot. Seyfedeen's uh, The Bitcoin Standard, which is a fantastic book. And my favorite parts of that book are about this idea of stock to flow throughout and what that means theoretically for Bitcoin, the beauty of the difficulty adjustment, which I saw him speak on stage in Dallas in 2018, nice. it blew my mind because I hadn't read his book at the time. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the word inflation is not something that I want to, I want to do it without that. I want to do it really in a different way. I can't write the same book as Safe did, or, you know, I have to write something new. So, you know, that's one of the choices that I can make to differentiate the book. That's awesome. A little kind of off topic. Um, your book is great. Um, we're thinking about obviously like Bretton Woods in the past. Do you foresee something like that happen again in the future involving Bitcoin or? I think it's way more naturally occurring than, an, than any agreement. Um, and, you know, I don't think that the first country to announce Bitcoin reserves on their central bank balance sheet has an underpinning to the value of their currency, not that their currency is pegged to Bitcoin, but that part of the asset base on that bank's balance sheet, central bank, um, is Bitcoin. You think they're going to ask permission or tell anybody? Yeah. No, they're not going to tell anybody before. They're not going to call around and say, hey, do you want to buy Bitcoin? Because mm -hmm. then they'll get a worse price mm -hmm. when your neighbor front runs you. And so I think that like Bitcoin, it, it is gravity. It's going to pull more and more people, users, countries, banks toward it. And through that, we, we get a Bitcoin standard naturally. And that's the, you know, that's the other thing I tried to do was explain like how we get to a Bitcoin centric monetary system. And if you look at that last pyramid, Bitcoin relationship with central bank digital currencies, it's, it's hierarchical where Bitcoin is on the first layer and central bank digital currencies are on the second layer, not because the central bank pegged it, but because the currency has a price relationship to Bitcoin and that Bitcoin is the end denominator for everybody. And it governs the price of all other things. That's why it's the first layer, not because people got in a room. So, um, no, I don't think I don't think we're gonna get that. The, I mean, with Bitcoin, right. yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, they might try it with 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 their non-Bitcoin 
stuff or to get CBDCs into a basket that's more global. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to say likely, but yes, that is definitely a possibility. I wouldn't say like more than 50 or less than 50, but it's definitely a possibility and um, something to watch for. Gotcha. Thank you. And there's all, I mean, listen, the BIS, Bank of International Settlements, IMF, they all write papers about this all the time. The SDR is that, you know, and so, um, you know, definitely a space to watch. Yeah, that's interesting for sure. All right, um, Michael Saylor, villain, hero, <laughs> ESG. What's up with these secret meetings, secret conferences that's happening? Give me your thoughts on that if you've been following yeah. it at all. Listen, definitely not a villain. Okay. Um, uh, dangerous to call anybody a hero. And I think in Bitcoin, we slay our heroes. Matt Odell says that. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that that's awesome because um, like Trace Mayer, one of my favorite people when I was in the rabbit hole learning, and then he comes out and pumps some shit coin at a conference and, and you're like, okay, it doesn't mean I unlearned what he taught me. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's why you don't have heroes. Um, right. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's, it's important that we don't, uh, assign anybody too high at the status in Bitcoin. Indeed. There's no hero in Bitcoin. That's very, very important. Um, there's, there's, there are people that are working on it and that believe in it and advocate for it. And some can call those people heroes or, you know, that they're, um, you know, their guidance uh, and all all that. So, but is it a villain? I think it's way too early to say. First of all, I'm the type of guy, I'm a researcher, I'm not a news reader. So Mm -hmm. I never read any article on day one. Like I just, it's my philosophy. I don't read it right away. I'll wait a week, let it play out, let people chat let people digest, then I'll start reading and researching and digesting. So let this play out. Um, if, if it's nefarious, like he's trying to come in and like uh, co-opt it, he's going to get, he's going to get slayed. <laughs> he's going to get slayed. Um, so it's, it's, it's way too early. Now, with that being said, driving a greener narrative for Bitcoin mining is what we're all trying to do in the first place. Right. Talking about how ridiculous the energy FUD is. So Mike Saylor is trying to do that. Like he's okay. just trying to, I think he's just trying to do that. He's trying to move the conversation in the direction. Square and ARK Invest put out their green Bitcoin piece two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Yeah. No one said anything about it. They're all like sending the link to each other yeah. and tweeting the link out. Yeah. So, but because you had a meeting and called it a council, everyone hated it. So yeah. um, the Elon yeah. guy too didn't help. Right, right. The Elon guy, <laughs> exactly. So, and, and their buddies and like Sailor convinced Elon to go long. And so come on. And they didn't sell it yet. So you have that supply removed for the market. So you're all benefiting. So yeah. let's not, let's not uh, keep any heroes, but let's not like slay Michael Saylor for um, trying to push a narrative. Um, but, but, but watch closely. And I tweeted this, like, I don't think it's, I don't think it's like a Segwit war all over again that it doesn't feel like that to me but good on bitcoiners for being cautious and being like don't you know don't centralize anything we hate you now because <laughs> because you tried to do this and let them do that and i'm not i'm i'm, I'm not gonna um, fault anybody for like being too cautious bitcoin yeah. is anti-fragile it's like it, it's uh you know the the threat models um all come into play and everyone's read that threat model thing and so and when, when anything raises a red flag, you're like, no, I, I don't want that. Um, get Mike Saylor out of here, you know, get Elon out. We don't want either of these guys ever again. And that's fine. Um, that's fine too. But um, I like Michael Saylor. I think that he's a welcome addition. I was actually writing layered money when he got super popular. And I'm like, who is this Mike Saylor guy that everyone keeps talking about? What's micro strategy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, and then mm-hmm. obviously like the, the bond issuance. And I, I wrote an article about that, um, you know, right around when my book came out, because that was fascinating to me that there's this guy here. But, I, you know, I think he's a welcome addition. And um, you know, he talks like a Bitcoiner. Uh, you know, he tweets like a Bitcoiner. Mm-hmm. And um, so... Uh, let's give it some time, but um, I'm okay with people slaying him for now. Yeah, yeah. 
I agree with the time thing. I fear him being like a Trojan horse, though. I fear him like, you know, siding with us and, and, and being a pleb, quote unquote, and doing all this stuff when, you know, at the end of the day, he's trying to speak for Bitcoin in the background because it shouldn't be private. I mean, I'm not saying disclose the whole conversation, uh, but it shouldn't be private. And like I was telling Ben a little while ago, I didn't see any of like, you know, uh, like, you know, like the, the mining pools were involved, though. I didn't see any of like the Great American Mining is the only one I can think of or the Marty Bents of the world, like these real Bitcoiners that are doing this. I didn't see them even get bothered to be involved. Just a bunch of billionaires doing billionaire stuff. Um, so I agree with you. No hero, no villain. But I, I got my eye on this one. And, because... and, and why tweet it? Like when, when you like, OK, right. here's a, just my own personal small example. I didn't tell anybody I was writing layered money until it was almost almost done like right. mm-hmm. really like i mean um and you know 90 percent done because why i mean right right you know, and so why tell us like we had a chat okay that's it right yeah. you had a chat good for you um so that's part of why it doesn't bother me that much because it's just like a chat but you know yeah. why even why even say anything how about do something and show us what you're doing. And then we might not criticize it because, you know, you wrote something instead of tweeted something. Right. I think we so all agree good. that they, they handled it wrong. They, they handled sure. it the worst yeah. way they could do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, keep an eye on it. Um, so I, I guess, Nick, before we uh, give you a little spot here so you could, you know, plug the book and anything else you got going on, it would be it would be natural to ask you about your thoughts on the price action. Uh, we've been sitting in the 30s for, you know, about a week or so. Um, after the whole Elon thing, supposedly, uh, what are your thoughts on price? Where do you see us going in the near future and in the long one? I'm sure you're yeah. bullish, but yeah, I love the price action. Um, I, I, uh, especially, um, especially the, the, you know, the buying support, the bounces off of the, the 30k level. And so, you know, I love the price. I think that, um, we still are mid mid bull cycle. And it's the focus of my research is trying to figure out more and more how to value this thing. So I'm, I'm looking now, I'm really trying to study plan B, Willy Woo, and, you know, the glass node guys that are out there on Twitter now that are tweeting mm-hmm. all these things. I'm really trying to understand that stuff. That's the next level. A lot of it goes over my head, but there's, there's fundamental analysis to be done. That's apart from the price analysis that I do all the time and looking at the chart. And so, um, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, you know, staying, staying above 30,000 for another four to six months would be fantastic because it sets up the base for, for, you know, the supply shock to, to send the price up in the future. So, you know, no, no short-term price predictions, but, um, love the price here and, um, love Bitcoin to stay above 30 K for as long as it can. And you know, not break down um, back down to to twenty k because that unwinds a lot of that um, you know momentum. So you know th- that would be my 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 little brief chart analysis for you guys. Cool, super. Uh, are you heading to Miami in, uh, next week? I'm not. Um, you know, I'm gonna have a little bit of FOMO, but um, <laughs> uh, I got I got I got my own travel plans uh, for the rest of the year. I'm really looking forward to uh, Dallas and Bit Block Boom. Fantastic. Uh, guys, Gary Leland, the organizer, is a great guy. I have a lot of friends that are going to be there, and um, some online friends that are hoping to meet for the first time in person. So, looking forward to Dallas, and I'll be in Austin later this year, um, and you know, trying to work on some other things as well. Awesome, man! Yeah, I'll be in Austin next month. I don't know if you'll be there, but <laughs> no, gonna, not yet. But uh, we're, we're going to delay. Year. We're going to delay gratification on Miami too. Um, I, I agree, FOMO a little bit, but. I also see a lot of chaos happening. Me and Beth talked about it last week. I was was in San Francisco, Bitcoin 2019. It was fun, but it's it's a lot of people. And, um, (laughs) you know, (laughs) I'm not going with some crew. I'm like, you know, just myself. And so it's not like I don't know people, but it'd be a little too hectic for me. And, uh, you know, prefer a little bit smaller size conference. Yeah, they're doing that. And then there's the Mayweather fight the same time and i'm just like you're gonna have all these new bitcoin millionaires in the place and then you're gonna have this whole mayweather crowd in the same place throughout everyone's gonna be at the same hotels same pools same bars same restaurants a lot of testosterone uh, going around a lot of (laughs) testosterone so Uh, it's gonna be a nightmare yeah 
You got anything else for Nick, man? No, um, book was great. Uh, had a blast on the podcast. Thanks for your time. Uh, looking forward. You're working on another book? I am. I just awesome. started work on it and, you know, it's going to be a long research project, uh, process. Got so, it. um, a lot of reading and, uh, no writing yet. So just a lot of reading and, um, but I'm all in on this thing, guys, that, you know, uh, um, Love it. you know, made that decision to write a book and then made the decision this year to become a Bitcoin author, which that's not the decision I made last year. The decision was write a book. Yeah. And so uh, book one went well, so it's, it's time for the next one and okay. you know, keep me sharp. And, uh, um, you know, my contribution to Bitcoin is this, this is my way to do it. So I want to keep doing that. Yeah. No, forward I mean, to it. Yeah. I think you transitioned in there. Well, um, you're an inspiration to me. I'm also trying to write in the space and contribute as much as I can just to give back what I've gotten so much of. And you're, you're, you're an uh, inspiration for me for sure. Nick, uh, let the listeners know where they can find the book, where they can find any of your information, any of your articles and anywhere you want to send them. Thank you guys. And I appreciate your kind words about the book. Um, you guys can find my book layered money on Amazon or Google it. Uh, it's, 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 uh, on retailers all around the world. You can find me at layeredmoney.com and links to the book there. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter and Medium at time value BTC. And uh, let me know what you think of the book, Bribe Review on Amazon. And uh, thanks again for having me on, guys. No, oh, yeah, thank you, Nick. Guys, go check out the book. The book is incredible. Go check it out on Audible. Go buy it on Amazon. Go to Nick's website, wherever it is you can get it. It's a really good read. Fundamental for the understanding of what we got going on here. Nick, one more time. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, you. I told you in the little break we had there that, uh, that, you know, for us young podcasters in this space, it's awesome when somebody like you is willing to, to, to volunteer their time, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Appreciate right. it. Awesome. Like, guys, please rate, share, and subscribe the episode. That's how we can continue to have these conversations for you guys. We'll see you guys next week in episode 23. Appreciate y'all. Later.